Welcome everyone. This is Blake over at DZone. I'm the community manager here with special guest today, Dmitry Sonikov from 42 Crunch, and he's going to be taking us through the latest API security vulnerabilities. And I'll put into chat, he does the API Security Weekly, so I'll put in chat a link to his DZone profile so that you'll never miss those. So without further ado, let me turn it over to our very special guest, Mr. Dmitry Sonikov. Thank you. Thank you, Blake. So um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Um, so uh, this is a new series that, that we are starting, and uh, Blake uh, takes the credit on uh, setting this up and, and coming up with the idea. So every, every week uh, on DZone and at APSQ.io, we publish uh, a weekly newsletter on the latest um, news from the world of API security. And obviously, API security, APIs are everywhere, right? Most of the modern applications have many, many APIs. APIs between the front end and uh, the back end, um, kind of between the cloud component and your, your web app or your mobile app. Uh, APIs between the different microservices that um, constitute your, your application back end. And uh, attackers are attacking these APIs. Uh, so every week there are some new vulnerabilities, some new breaches, some new attacks. So we go through them and we also cover all the industry best practices, tools, uh, new standards, um, and new uh, cheat sheets, material, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we cover that. Uh, there's a daily, daily news, weekly newsletter to which you can subscribe via email or um, read it at the APSQD on DZone. And so in this, um, Today, we'll just talk about some of the recent. I, I just took four um, different recent vulnerabilities that we covered in the last uh, five weeks, uh, last five, four or five issues of the newsletter. Um, and we'll, we'll go quickly through the details of each and every one of those and what happened, how these particular vulnerabilities could have been prevented. Um, and then I'll be happy to answer any any questions and answer uh, any any questions that you might have. So please start posting your your questions um, in the chat uh, so you don't forget, uh, and we'll answer all of them at the end of the um, of that presentation. So let's start with the first one. This one actually will be in uh, this Thursday's newsletter. So it's not in the in the newsletter yet, but you'll read about it in detail Thursday. So it's a pretty scary one. Uh, Microsoft Teams is a very popular system that a lot of a lot of you are probably using um, if you are kind of a Microsoft shop. Um, and uh, the vulnerability that they um, just had and, and just fixed is that an attacker could create a tab um, in any of the channels in Teams, and then it was sufficient for someone to just click the tab, just get on that tab uh, to have the uh, authentication token stolen, and that authentication token could then be used uh, by attackers uh, to basically access all the systems uh, within Teams and other Microsoft um, uh, services Microsoft within the Microsoft platform to steal their email messages, steal their chat messages, uh, steal their um, OneDrive files, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, for example, this is a quick video showing how uh, a hacker uh, an attacker is, is is stealing into another team's profile chats from the uh, from the victim, and so the way that this worked is that uh, basically uh, Teams is extensible as a lot of a lot of systems these days, like um, whatever Google Workspace have their Google um, App Script. Uh, Microsoft Teams is also extensible. There's Microsoft Power Apps, so you can add additional workflows, automation workflows, and and additional tabs, etc. Um, and so the, the problem is that uh, in the validation code that they had uh, for those extra tabs, uh, they verified, they, they thought that someone might um, create an attack. So uh, when they would load an element, an iframe into that tab, uh, they would validate that this uh, URL starts with makepowerapps.com, so it doesn't come from, from a random domain. Uh, with, with a random code. Unfortunately, uh, the problem is that uh, in the begin with, um, but begins with part of, of, that, of that frame. So someone could create 
a totally different code, put it on some other URL, uh, some other domain that the attackers control, like fake corp, for example. Uh, and they would just make it begin with what um, the validation rule expected. And then uh, because they would host their own code, they would be able to access the, the token, the authentication token. Uh, and then, uh, unfortunately, again, this uh, was aggravated further because there is um, an endpoint, appspowerreps.com, uh, Microsoft, that, that would allow to exchange that token to another token for another system. Again, from Microsoft perspective, from accessibility perspective, that makes it easier. A user just authenticates once, and then you can reuse that across different systems, like get access to, to Microsoft Graph and uh, App Dynamics, uh, and, and the Dynamics apps, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, obviously, for attackers, they've made it a lot of easier, a lot easier, because now uh, they could use, for example, even automation flows to just start getting any new files, any new messages, start accessing different files on the user behalf, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So basically, they, they, um, they could access any, any data, any private data of that um, user that the attacker should not get access to. And so here's the whole flow. We will not <laughs> go into details of it. Uh, but basically, that was the flow. Right? You get the attacker could create an iframe get one token, exchange it to other token, and then use uh, flows and other automation systems to, to retrieve uh, data from the victim. So this is a broken authentication um, uh, vulnerability. If we use um, OWASP API Security Top 10 um, uh, language um, terminology. So to prevent that, first, again, strictly validate all data, so URLs, parameters, payloads, anything coming from from, from other users, uh, from the user uh, or other components of the application. Um, zero trust is a, is a good uh, attitude to have. Uh, don't assume that because someone is calling your API, uh, this something is your own, whatever, component of your application. Uh, any other component could be compromised. So any, any API that you have should consider everything else to be potentially controlled by attackers. So everything needs to be validated. And again, when token exchanges are very dangerous, right? Because when one piece of your infrastructure gets uh, compromised, that means that attackers can, after that, go and compromise other things, other components. So um, consider adding explicit user approvals, uh, et cetera, et cetera. OK, uh, going to next one, uh, Peloton and Echelon. So these, are, uh, these both had API vulnerabilities. Uh, so if you remember when uh, uh, when the current U.S. president, President Biden, was uh, uh, elected, uh, the security service didn't let him take his um, exercise, his private exercise equipment from, from Peloton into the White House, citing uh, security concerns. And so it turned out that Peloton and, and actually their, their main competitor, Echelon, were both uh, vulnerable, had API vulnerabilities. So these are smart uh, connected devices. So when you exercise, you can um, have that social experience with your uh, with your um, with your coach, uh, with with other uh, people exercising, etc. So that means that your device uh, has applications. These applications talk to some sort of cloud component uh, that deliver that that social experience. And unfortunately, these APIs were, were vulnerable uh, in both of the systems. So in case of Peloton. Uh, the API point had no authentication whatsoever, so anyone could just go to that API and talk to it directly. Uh, so, and then when the company added authentication, they still haven't added authorization. So basically, anyone with any Peloton account, there are like three million of them, I think, uh, I can just go ahead and create a Peloton account for me. Uh, I could. I get information not just from my profile, but from any profile of any other user, as long as I knew the, the ID of that account. And uh, the privacy was enforced just by application and not by the API, right? So I could access information even from private uh, profiles, from the profiles that users explicitly made private and were not expected to be shared, right? So for example, on this screenshot, you can see that for this profile, uh, there is a field saying, is uh, profile private true, uh, but um, researchers could still access all that information. And obviously a lot of 
information gets gets retrieved, right? You can see that the picture of the user, you can see the age, uh, gender, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also, researchers found that besides the main API, there were all other APIs like GraphQL endpoints, etc., that they could also access and get even more information. And what's make it worse when researchers found the vulnerability and the company eventually fixed it, the company didn't have any any logs, uh, any monitor, monitoring capabilities to even be able to say whether uh, this uh, flaw this uh, has ever been breached, whether the researchers were the first ones who found it, or there was someone else collecting all the data uh, while the vulnerability was there. Similar th thing with Echelon. Again, they had no, uh, they had authentication on the endpoint to get user profiles, but they didn't have authorization. So again, if I just know user IDs, I can start getting information on all these users. You can see that actually if with Echelon, the data that they returned was much worse. You can get a lot of private data here. Uh, you can get exact uh, physical address, uh birthday weight uh, equipment information like serial number where they bought the equipment all the history of their workouts etc etc so th this is extremely private um and uh, there was another endpoint leaderboard which is sort of uh, an endpoint that the application used to display your class information and who is uh, doing um, how well everyone in the class was doing and this one was not protected at all like any, anyone could just get any information about about the classes that was, were going on and which users were there. Also, they had um, an API to find users by email address. Again, makes it even uh, worse. Now you can, for someone whose email address you know, you can see if they were using Echelon, they get their user ID and then get all of the information. And um, one other common issue, uh, that they had was within the, all the pictures that users could upload, there was all metadata in the picture, like the, the exact GPS coordinates, etc., making it even an even bigger privacy issue. How to prevent? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, there's a broken object level authorization, right? So in, in both cases, one could get not just his or her information, but also information about other users. Uh, broken authentication, some APIs were not, um, had no security whatsoever. Uh, and definitely excessive data exposure. A lot of data was getting exposed. And as I mentioned, insufficient logging and monitoring, the companies could not tell whether the, the problem uh, uh, was even breached or not. So uh, how to prevent, find all of your APIs, do API discovery and, and find all of your APIs that lack authentication, that lack security and, and, and fix that. Everyone knows that there's no such thing as internal API. All APIs could become external. Uh, implement authorization, right? One thing is authentication, so that the user has an account. And the other is authorization. Is that user allowed to access that data? Uh, if they belong to someone else, they, they, they should not. Um, collect only the information you need. Don't just, if you are on the application site, don't collect the data that, that you don't need. Um, and strip out all metadata, et cetera. Um, define what your API is. Um, I expose it and make sure you don't expose more, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay. Uh, Rocket Chat. So Rocket Chat is a popular um, chat um, application uh, that a lot private chat that a lot of enterprises are using. So it has many, many thousands, like eight hundred thousand, I think, users something. Like it's it's a it's a very popular. So the the problem that they had was that uh, for accounts that didn't have multi-factor authentication, um, at, uh, researchers found a way to get the password reset token for the account. Then they could log in for the, um, as that account. Uh, and uh, for admin accounts, even those that had two-factor authentication, they could then extract email, password hash, and, and two-factor uh, authentication secret, second-factor authentication secret, Log in as that admin and then take over the account and uh, execute any code um, on that user behalf. So the, pro the way that that happened is that uh, the MongoDB is a database used behind the scenes to power the application. And um, at, uh, researchers found a way uh, in the parameters of the API calls 
to supply instead of the regular stream that the API expected to supply uh, NoSQL injections. And that was because the application did have some protection. So the application code was verifying that they were not getting SQL injection. But uh, MongoDB is a very powerful, has a very powerful uh, language. And so researchers found uh, some expressions that were not blocked uh, by those checks. So basically in the code, the code was checking that these particular expressions were not used, but uh, researchers just found different different expressions. For example, they could supply something like that. Uh, the where uh, um, clause was not, the where expression was not blocked. And so they could supply something like, like that that would throw, uh, that would get information within the, uh, the Mongo. And uh, for example, in that case, it's an uncaught exception. And you can see that this actually throws the, the secret of that user. And that's how the data are leaked. So I would say it's a broken authentication and excessive data exposure. Again, strictly define and force all your API inputs. It's for any screen, I mean, define any, any data types. If it's a screen, define the exact regular expression of what is allowed. If it's alphanumeric only, then, then so be it. Define that whatever it's uh, from 1 to 20 characters and has all, only, only alphanumeric characters, something like that. Uh, define outputs as well, right? So if your API does leak data, that I can get prevented uh, because that's an unexpected output. And again, block lists don't work well. I use allow list. So only allow the stuff that you expect and everything else needs, needs to be blocked. Obviously, two-factor authentication is a good idea on our accounts. And finally, the, the final one that I want to talk about is a very recent one in uh, Apache Pulsar. Um, so Apache Pulsar, for, for those uh, deployments that use JWT, JSON Web Token for um, authentication, Attackers found a way to forge those JWT tokens and avoid signature validation. So I will not talk in detail about uh, JWT. Uh, I could talk about it for hours and hours. But basically, JWT token is a token that APIs can have. They look something like this. Uh, uh, these are base 42 encoded um, header that defines what kind of token it is, uh, body that defines the actual data and the signature. Um, and so the way that this was attacked um, is using the NAN algorithm attack. So basically, if you have something like this, right? So you would have the header that defines which algorithm is used uh, for the signature. You have the body with some information about the user. For example, here's me and says that his admin is false and then the signature. So no one can forge that. So attackers, obviously, if they just modify uh, the data, then the data changes. And so this signature becomes invalid. And so that means that it, it's no longer a valid token. Uh, however, um, if attackers change the algorithm, see that HS256, uh, change that to none, meaning no, no signature is required, then all of a sudden this becomes a valid thing because it doesn't require signature, right? Um, and so uh, the problem, so basically you get a token like this that just has the header and uh, the main body, but no signature. And so they, they send it. And the problem is that if your backend implementation doesn't check that your algorithm is what is expected, like this one, um, uh, and just accepts whatever, whatever algorithm is sent, then this all of a sudden, this becomes a valid, uh, valid token and anyone um, can use it, right? And that means that attackers can do anything, right? They, they can intercept token and then change it to whether, whatever the way they want. They can make it all of a sudden they can change the user information so they can use a token on someone else's behalf or they can make themselves whatever admins give themselves more permissions etc so how to prevent just don't assume that if it's jwt or soap ID connect or any any other uh, cool technology that you're just automatically safe uh, these all can potentially be vulnerable if you don't use them correctly uh, carefully read the documentation, current security best practices. Make sure that if you're using some sort of uh, framework um, to implement them, that you're using that framework correctly. For example, in this particular case, case in Apache Pulsar, uh, developers could use just a different method of the same framework to make sure that, that when they um, get information from the token, the signature is checked, uh, but they use a different one that they didn't have the check. 
And um, if you can, if you use a, a product can that, that uh, in which you can define your JWT policies and externalize the enforcement, so you don't rely on developers not forgetting to use the proper um, check themselves, uh, please do use it. Okay, so we have just a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll do a quick summary and then I'll be happy to answer your, your questions. Um, so please uh, start posting your questions into the chat. Uh, we, uh, my, so from my perspective, uh, the best way uh, to make sure that your APIs are secure is just make them secure by design. So that means that implement them correctly and then automate all the checks in your CACD pipeline in your DevSecOps process, right? So when you're developing your APIs, make sure you define your APIs, for example, using API contract standards like OpenID, uh, like, uh, excuse me, OpenAPI, what used to be called Swagger. Uh, there are popular free ID plugins for VS Code, IntelliJ Eclipse that you can use from foot to branch where it happened to, to work. Uh, that, that you can use to make sure that uh, the contracts are properly defined. So use them, they, they, they are free. Uh, make sure that you test uh, your um, APIs, uh, both using static uh, code analysis for the uh, API contract, um, as I mentioned, and, and dynamic conformance scan to make sure that the implementation uh, actually matches the contract. And again, make sure that you deploy it with the with the protection. You have you're using some sort of API firewall from port to branch in another company that actually enforces that contract. Again, use positive security model. As we mentioned, block list, deny list don't work well. Allow list, positive security model is a much better model. Uh, so that's a very quick overview uh, of just a few of the recent uh, vulnerabilities and breaches. Uh, we have a lot of them in the newsletter. Subscribe to the newsletter, uh, read all those stories in detail, and uh, keep your API secure. With that, I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Do we have any, Blake? All right. So this is Blake over at DZone. Uh, so we are now into the Q&A portion of the live event today for questions and answers. You can put those into chat, whether you're on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, um, put those questions in. I guess the, the, the first question for some of the people coming in, you do an API security weekly, what day of the week or generally when do those go, go out so people can watch for them? Mm -hmm. uh, great question. So that happens every Thursday so if you are subscribed to the email, you should get that around 9 a.m. your time zone. Um, and then uh, again on DZone, on the actual website, again, that happens around, around midnight Central European time and then on, on Thursday and then on DZone, again, shortly after, depending on how quickly the, the editors get that approved, push that through. So generally by um, Thursday US time or Friday the latest, you should be able to see it. Excellent. And then I saw for today, we had users from Seattle, from Cleveland, from France, and then people staying up late in India. Uh, so thanks, oh. for, thanks for basically, we, we, we're covering like North America, Europe, and Asia here today. So it looks like we got two questions. Let me get the first one up. On here. So the first question is going to come from Mohan uh, up on the screen. How do you scale up API security with the explosion of APIs being released? Oh, that's actually an excellent question. Um, because when I started working in the API space in whatever, maybe eight years ago, there were not that many APIs. The API management was actually fairly easy. APIs companies would have uh, really few APIs. It was easy to review them, they, they would rarely change. These days, there's a whole explosion with the serverless microservices, cloud native architectures, and everyone trying to be agile. So companies have hundreds, if not thousands of APIs. They keep changing all the time, et cetera. So the only way from my perspective is to automate, is to just put API security in your, in your pipeline, make sure that your developers follow uh, security best practices, make sure that the tests are there in the pipeline, make sure that your 
that your uh, runtime, that your actual deployments are protected, your policies get automatically updated, etc. Just automate, 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 and and do post use positive security model. I think that's the only way to scale. Great, thanks for that question, Mohan. And then moving next, we've got Yang Yu with the question: What are the recommended auth authentication methods for APIs? Okay, uh, again, great question. So uh, uh, we we could do a whole separate uh, webinar on that one. Uh, so to to answer quickly within within a minute or two, uh, use don't reinvent the wheel. I uh, use uh, auth open id connect at the most uh at, at the industry stands right now uh make sure that you augment that with other um uh, with other limitations based on the architecture of your application like for, for example if you have some sort of a uh, microservices architecture and you have a microservice in the back end that is only supposed to be answering to a specific other microservice in the in the back end, just don't let it to answer to anyone else. Like use mutual TLS, uh, use IP whitelisting, uh, use uh, uh, service meshes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So just define who is supposed to talk to who. Uh, make sure you enforce that, uh, and that is the only way that your APIs actually um, talk to each other. Um, and and use industry standards and and uh, security best practices, current security best practices around these industry standards, like OAuth and OpenID Connect. All right, thanks for that one. Our next question comes from Michael Bond on Facebook. Are there any automated tools that can be used to automatically test your API, um, like fuzz testing for APIs? Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> So I, I kind of have a little bit of a conflict of interest here because I work for Force Crunch that that has tools like that. So uh, check this out. Go to ForceCrunch.com and, and check out these tools. There are uh, like the we have a fuzzing tool, conformance scan that I mentioned. They can take your open ID, uh, your open API definition, uh, your contract, and generate a security test to make sure that the implementation conforms. Uh, to these, uh, uh, to your contract. There are some open source tools as well, like um, OWASP, uh, Zap, um, etc. Uh, we again in the newsletter we 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 try to cover all the tools, um, uh, open source and not open source that that exist in that space. Great, thanks for that. And then we've got a question from David, I believe, was out of uh, France, who says, "Thanks, Dimitri." Does the 42 Crunch security scanner work on premise, or is it only a SaaS product? Uh, both, both on premise and 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 SaaS. Obviously, a lot of APIs, uh, especially there are a lot of private APIs that don't that are not exposed to the internet, and you you do want to, to test them, uh, and your whatever your your dev your your test your your staging environment might not be accessible from the internet. And as I mentioned, I I just don't believe that uh, such thing as an private API uh, exists. Any API that you have that even you created with a private use in mind uh, can potentially be attacked. So uh, I think there's, uh, again, you, you need to, to test and ensure security of all your APIs, not just the public publicly facing ones. OK, great. And then we've got one question on LinkedIn from Uni uh, Mana, who asked, is OP open API based on o OWASP, O-W-A-S-P? Mm -hmm. So open API is an industry standard. So that's that's different from OWASP. OWASP is again, it's it's another organization, industry organization. So open API is uh, uh, is led by uh, Linux Foundation uh, and Open API Initiative that has uh, I don't know I think probably close to 50 members right now, uh, including eBay, Google, Amazon, Fortune Crunch, et cetera, et cetera. So it is an industry and a standard and uh, and industry effort and an open standard to define APIs. OWASP is a is a group again industry group uh, for web um, application security that now has the they they became uh, famous for their OWASP um, web application top ten vulnerability list. Uh, in 2019, they came up with OWASP uh, API Security Top 10, and it's it's a it's a great organization to 
to participate in great efforts related to specifically application security, including APIs. All right, great. And then we've got a question from Scott. This is going to be a technical one. Uh, Scott off YouTube asks, are there automated tools that test for authentication, authorization, better, as these are typically harder to detect than traditional DAS SaaS testing? Uh, yeah, so great question. Uh, so IDOR, um, again, uh, IDOR is that broken uh, broken authentication, broken object uh, object level authentication authorization, a vulnerability that we talk about when you're accessing data that you should not be able to access that belongs to another user. That is harder to test automatically. Indeed, uh, there are tools to find those vulnerabilities and test for them. Um, again, some of that technology is coming uh, in the Forge branch uh, conformance scan shortly. That's in, in in private preview right now. Um, some of that functionality exists uh, in uh, tools like different Burp uh, plugins, where again you can test the same API on behalf of different users, and then implement your tests and say that I, I'll make my tests on as this user and and get the data for that user, but then I'll try to perform the same tests on behalf of a different user, but for the records of the first user. And all of these should fail. And if any of them succeed, it's an issue. It's a, it's a bola idol issue. Um, so yes, tools for like that exist. All right. And then uh, thanks for that one, Scott. And then we've got a question from Pratik Das, who asked, would you recommend to use API Gateway for delegating security concerns? Uh, so yes, API Gateways are important. Uh, and API management is important. Um, just. Uh, and API gateways can allow you to define different um, security policies. And, and um, for example, if you, you can use um, API gateways your auth, for your auth protection and use different um, scopes, et cetera. So uh, go ahead and use them. Just be aware of what API gateway provides and what it doesn't provide. Some API gateways um, can just do auth and, and just maybe rate limiting. Some are more advanced and can enforce, um, can do some of the data validation. Um, check what, what they can do. Check the API gateway and its functionality. Can it do data validation? Can it enforce the paths and the, the operations? Can it enforce the data validation for your API responses, not just for requests? Can it do things like uh, JWT policies, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, compile a list of things. Check what you're getting from your uh, API gateway. Uh, if your API gateway uh, can get that information from open API file from your contract, please use that to make sure that when your API changes, your enforcement rules, your protections change. And then for anything that your API gateway doesn't, doesn't do, um, using API firewalls, you can get the additional protection, like the um, better data validation, JWT policies, et cetera. And as I mentioned, typically the uh, API gateways are sort of something on your edge, protecting you from the external calls. Um, I would recommend that you augment that uh, with uh, some sort of a, uh, internal protection for each API, for each microservice, uh, using an API firewall as a sidecar proxy. And so you protect not only the north-south traffic, but also the east-west traffic. All right, great. And we've got two questions in here from David. So we'll go to these two questions from David. So the first one is, can 42 Crunch tool check if a internal secret is exposed? And then a second question from David was, nope, I just hit the same question twice. So it's not, okay. Yeah, so there we go. That's it. We just asked it twice. So. Sounds good. So yeah, so the, the way that uh, 42 Crunch works is that um, it sort of uh, on the on the analysis of the contracts, it forces you to define each and every uh, each and every response of each and every API. So obviously all the, all the inputs, all the payloads, but also the responses. So um, if you don't define that, if you just say whatever that API just returns something, whatever it returns a JSON, uh, then the, the tool will tell you that it's a potential vulnerability. You need to define that strictly. And so um, it would force you to, to do, or whatever, highly recommend and give you a lower security score, and then you can enforce that in your CACD pipeline. Um, and so you'll, you'll make your um, developers define all the outputs. 
and then it would use that as a positive security model. Um, so if your output is different, that kind of on the runtime protection side uh, or during the uh, conformance scan, during the dynamic testing, if the output is different, that gets reported or that gets blocked if you set it up um, to, to block uh, responses like that. And so if your API then starts starts leaking secrets like we've seen in the in case of uh, rocket chat, uh, that would get blocked. So that, that's how we can uh, uh, get your APIs to, to become secure by design and not leak that sensitive information. Okay, great. And then we've got just two more questions. I know we're running over. So we, uh, Demet we knew Dimitri was going to be really popular. So let's get to the Scott's uh, questions he's got lined up. And then we've got one more down here from uh, maybe Mesh. So Scott has two questions. So the first one, Without an API management platform, what recommendations to inventory APIs? How do you define an API versus service? And they have a follow-up, um, I believe, to that one is basically, is there one security test that covers all aspects of API testing? He knows it's a loaded question. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay, again, we, without... Uh, I would not go into the uh, kind of uh, into the debate of what's an API, what's a service. <laughs> uh, let's just say that anything that is any any service that that can be uh, accessed over the network is is an API. It can be a REST API, a GraphQL API, and async API, etc. But it, it's an API if someone can invoke it over, over the network. Uh, at, at least for the for the sake of, of this particular uh, discussion and the context of, of this webinar. Um, and then in terms of API management platforms, uh, again, like I said, I am a fan of API management and API gateways. I, I think that in most cases, it makes sense to use them. Uh, you, um, indeed, you might get some APIs that are not that have not been published to the gateway, sort of, so your, your rogue APIs that are harder uh, to find because of that. Uh, you could, uh, there are a couple ways that you could potentially look for them. One is looking for them in the, in the traffic and, and doing discovery and discovering APIs uh, just using your, um, in your um, applications in, in your network. And then secondly, the other way you could uh, find and discover those APIs would be uh, by, by looking at the source co code. So going through your repositories, uh, find any APIs used from your JavaScript files, or just find any, any API files, like open API files, that those JSONs and, and YAMLs that define your API. Again, in most companies, um, source code repositories would be a great place uh, to crawl and to find those uh, those APIs, and again, there are tools from Port to Crunch and 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 other uh, companies um, that can help you um, do that. All right, and then we've got the question from Umash. So, is gRPC efficient or more efficient than REST in terms of API designing? Uh, yes, in general, yes. Uh, gRPC uh, is a good protocol because it's it is sort of by design, it is uh, contract-based, so that the, uh, it kind of forces um, developers to define uh, the the, um, the expected inputs and outputs, and so um, it kind of kind of uh, puts developers into that um, into that uh, thought process of uh, hey, let me define what my API needs and what it what it returns and. And then in, it enforces those things. So yes, for um, especially like microservice to microservice communications, um, I think gRPC is, is, is a good choice. All right, and looks like David uh, snuck one more question in. So it's around 42 crunch. So I'm assuming you'll want to take it as our, our last question. So he says, can 42 crunch identify, recognize if the API request is attacking the endpoint, a kind of machine learning detection or someone is trying to forge an attack? Mm -hmm. uh, good question. So uh, no, Fortu Crunch is not, um, it's not a machine learning um, AI uh, approach. Uh, there are other, other products out there. Uh, again, there are actually a, a lot of them, so I, I will not um, name them, so I don't kind of promote one at the expense of, um, of uh, another. Uh, again, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, anomaly detection kind of systems out there. 
Um, so you can use them uh, in addition to for to crunch and in addition to the API gateway. Uh, they would look at the traffic, and then what they try to do is they try to figure out they they try to learn from your traffic, and if something um, some sort of calls start coming in that look anomalous, that look different from what they've seen before, they can flag that and, and, and let you know. So um, if you want that kind of um, anomaly detection machine learning um, approach, uh, I think that can uh, indeed complement kind of positive security model. Um, I would not use it as a replacement for the positive security model. I personally think that API security by design is a um, is something that you need to do first, uh, because again, with anomaly detection, um, sometimes the anomaly might be there for a reason. For example, that the pattern changes because your API changed, or because it's uh, whatever the, the holiday season and everyone is is now trying to to buy your products, so the products became more expensive, or whatever. There are legitimate reasons for something to to start looking anomalous. Um, and also machine learning algorithms can be harder to train because it's just hard to, to find a lot of traffic that is 100% legitimate and doesn't already have attacks, etc. So um, again, uh, machine learning has their issues and their limits, but I, I think uh, in, in some cases uh, it indeed uh, can serve as an additional, um, additional tool that can help you define anomalous, uh, anomalies in, in the traffic. So uh, yes, tools like that exist. Great, and then as I just saw Scott had followed up, it's not a question, he just said, good answer on definition. Still it has to have a defined interface, WSDL or open API spec for some tools to be effective, I found lots of services that needed spec. Mm -hmm. So that's a good yeah. follow up from, from uh, Scott there and it, if, if you have any additional questions from Dimitri, this audience is so passionate and just loves connecting with you. Um, we'll save up your questions, I guess, for next time or when the API Security Weekly goes live this Thursday on Dimitri's newsletter. There's a link to that in the chat or on DZone. Um, you can post your questions in there or we'll just take any for the for the next time. See someone else also out of North Carolina. But uh, Dimitri, you've got a great, passionate, excited, um, audience today that really sees you as as an expert in API, API security. So it's a huge honor for DZone to have you for this event today. Uh, so just really thanks to everyone around the world. Uh, literally, we had everyone from all the, the big continents on with us today. I'm Blake at DZone. And then Dimitri, if you want to take us out with any final words and wherever you are, um, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Blake. Thank, thanks a lot for setting this up. Uh, and obviously, a huge, a huge thanks for for DZone for the for the support on spreading the the word on API security. API security is, is extremely important. Uh, by uh, uh, Gartner uh, research estimates, it is now becoming the the number one attack vector for for applications. So um, most likely, your applications have APIs. Make sure that they are secure by design. Thank you.